All right, Joe, how's it going? It's so great to have you on The Long Game. Thanks so much for making the time. Yeah, it's going well, and I'm really excited to be here. Sweet. So let's jump straight into it. You're currently VP of Growth Marketing Entra, and we met, I guess, about a year ago from working together at People AI. And I like to think we became good friends uh, after one of our, our business trips out to New York. So what, what remem- reminded me of our conversation was um, you're the first person to actually explain what account-based marketing was to me. It's always been a very vague thing to myself and, and peers. So we'll talk about that later. So before we get to that, uh, you told me the story about how you got into tech. I think it's a really fun story um, about how you moved from San Diego. So yeah. maybe we can start there. Tell me about that story of where you were before you got into tech and how you made that transition. Yeah, I'm guessing what you're you're referencing is I I started my career post college thinking I wanted to be a pastor. So I was a I was a college <laughs> pastor for four years. And I, I, I have what they call a master's of divinity. I don't know how you master's the, the, the divine, but that's what I was studying. And, um, and uh, you know, in, in that process, I, I kind of stumbled into marketing. I was working for a, a nonprofit um, micro lender in San Diego, paying my way through seminary. Uh, and, um, and, and through all that, I, I realized, you know, I'm, 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 I, I don't think I... I want to do this anymore. So I, I graduate from my uh, my master's program. My mom's like, so what? Are you going to get a church job now? And I told her, no, nah, I, I think I'm going to move to San Francisco and live in a hacker house and uh, try to get into tech. I think she completely thought I'd lost my mind. Uh, but that's what I did. I uh, literally packed all my possessions, uh, 29 into two SUVs. I sold the house that I bought in San Diego. I moved into uh, moved up to San Francisco. Lived in a the, in a, in a one bedroom a hacker house, or like a, a one bedroom in a hacker house. It was the size of a walk-in closet with like eighteen other uh, mostly men, and I just tried to break into tech. Um, and uh, it was four to five months of full time grinding, watching my uh, net worth you know fall in the tens of thousands under zero. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I got my first startup gig. So, um, that's, what, that's what did that, started. yeah. What did that time look like? So you're living in this hacker house, which I had not heard of before, but I can imagine what it looks like, but what were you doing in that time to like try to break into tech? Yeah. Um, at that time there was, you know, uh, this was seven, eight years ago now. So boot camps were, were having its heyday. Not only developer boot camps, but also boot camps for mar- uh, marketers. Or at that time, we were calling them growth hackers. Boot camps for growth hackers, and boot camp for product management and and design, UX design, and and all, you know sales. And so I was doing a, a growth hacker boot camp, uh, and and that was three months, uh, sixty hours a week. You know, and yeah, there was some classes, but really, I think what boot the boot camp provided me was uh, you know the network. The friends, right? Just to you know, I mean, a lot of these these folks became my best friends. It was like a, almost like a concentrated MBA experience. I, I think about, and and then I think the the most important thing, the excuse to just focus on my career for three months, right? Because I went and told my parents, I'm doing this boot camp. They like guarantee I'm going to get a job. Like my parents, while they thought I was crazy, they they still understood the concept of school. And career development, and and it was the excuse basically to 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 really commit myself full time to trying to get into tech, and that's really what I think I got out of, out of it. On the hacker house side, I mean, literally, I think it was eighteen people uh, living in this house. I think uh, sixteen of us were guys sharing what was functionally two bathrooms. Uh, so uh, you can <laughs> oh, uh, you can imagine what uh, what what that experience was like. But you know. Um, I mean, I think back to those four or five months and as stressful and uh, uncertain as my life was at that time, it, w- it, it really served as, as just an amazing foundation um, uh, to, to being in San Francisco, uh, some of the most fun I'd ever had in my life. And actually, it was right around 2015. So it was kind of the heyday, not only of boot camps, but of uh, uh, Web 2.0. I mean, there was a new app being released every single week. I mean, I, I mean, there were like people passing out flyers on market, uh, just promoting the new app. And so being 
in that kind of educational environment while there was two or three apps being released every week. I mean, we, I remember my, at one point, my phone probably had 200 apps that we were just testing and trying to understand. And it was, um, I was really fortunate. I, 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 you know, people ask me nowadays, do, do I recommend them coming and doing this? And I'm like, you know, I don't know, like it worked for me, but I, I think it was partly also just a, a result of, 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 the time, right? That that I, I got so much success out of it. I think things have changed a little bit in terms of um, you know, kind of the whole boot camp arena nowadays. Yeah, it, it sounds like you definitely burned the boats with the move up to San Francisco. Much more risk than I would personally take, but it worked out for you. And you say it was like a condensed MBA, but probably cheaper than yep. an MBA and took less time. So yep. it, it seemed to have many pros. Probably about half the price of a semester of an MBA, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a great deal. So now uh, you're at Entra as VP of growth marketing. Tell, tell us about, you know, you broke into tech and now you're at Entra. What was that journey like? Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things I really actually disagreed with the bootcamp on, they had career coaching and it was this very millennial, you know, uh, you know, fake it till you make it, shoot for your dream company and, and, and go get it, right? Do the, do the networking. If you want to work for Uber, if you want to work for Airbnb, go find an executive there and just like force your way in was kind of the mantra. Uh-huh. And I, I just didn't believe them, right? Like I, I, my teacher at, at the bootcamp called me the, the, the persistent skeptic as a, as a negative thing. And I, I actually saw that as a good thing, right? Because I, I just didn't drink that part of the Kool-Aid. So for me, early in my tech career, I optimized for experience and title over sexiness of the company. Uh, and, and so I got in uh, as a demand gen manager into, it was a startup called NetPulse. Um, really interesting background. Like it was uh, founded probably 10 years before by like one of the co-founders of, of Intuit. And uh they, 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 their core product was selling TV screens on treadmills. So it was health tech and uh, yeah, and it was a hardware company and all of a sudden, um, uh, you know, all the OEMs, all the manufacturers of these treadmills, they started to bring all that in house. So, so NetPulse had to quickly pivot. And so they pivoted from this OEM uh, hardware focused company selling the five accounts to uh, uh, mobile apps for gyms. So it opened up the entire gym market and, and we were basically selling white label mobile apps for gyms, which if you are a gym member now is pretty de facto technology for your gym experience. Yeah. We really, I think, paved, paved the way for that. Um, and, and I joined right at that pivot and it was, uh, it was an exciting time. I mean, um, you know, I learned inbound marketing. We were a big HubSpot shop. So, you know, that was, I think, my, my first foray into marketing technology. And, you know, because the gym market uh, is mostly an SMB play, uh, you know, lead gen, content, email nurtures, I mean, all, all that played such a big role into that. Um, and then uh, and we, we grew quickly. I, I, uh, 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 within a year, you know, I, I basically rode the net pulse wave from 50 employees up to about 130 and then unfortunately back down to about 60 when I decided, all right, this isn't going anywhere. But in that time, I joined. So basically, I guess what I'm trying to say, I joined a company on no one's radar because it had been a hardware company for 10 years and was pivoting. Uh, and uh, and and um, and uh, I joined for the experience because it was probably a higher title than I could get at at a at a more sexy company. Uh, and and I joined at a time when I got to do a lot of things. So by the time I left NetPulse. I was running marketing. I was running implementation. I was running uh, biz ops or rev ops, you know, we call it now. And uh, believe it or not, I was uh, the head of people. So, so uh, <laughs> no, my, my least favorite, that. my least favorite part of that job was my weekly meeting with our office manager, where where I had to field snack complaints. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and but uh, and I because I had a, a seat at the table from a leadership point of view. I got to ride that wave of hyper growth. We ran out of TAM, basically. Like we, at, when we started, when we ran out of TAM, 
we basically realized we were, we, we, you know, six of the top 10 largest enterprises were already on our platform and there, you know, there was not much more to go. And so we quickly started to shrink after that. And so when I left, I was, you know, I had a lot of experience in a two year time. What that afforded me the opportunity to do was then I actually look for like a higher, like either director. And I actually landed a, a associate vice president uh, position at a company called Sutherland. If you haven't heard of it, prop makes sense to me. I hadn't either. It, Sutherland was a 30 year old BPO, business processing outsourcing company, billion dollar revenue, 60,000 employees across the world. And they were basically looking for a young tech startup guy to build out their digital engine. And so I was like the youngest executive in the room, probably by at least 20 years. And, and I literally, I, I really believe I got the job because who in the right mind would pick, you know, to work for a company like that in tech, right? And, and, and I did because I optimized for experience. I optimized for title. I knew that was the quickest way for me to, uh, uh, to accelerate my career and, and um, was there for another two years. I think the thing that I learned at Sutherland uh, that, um, you know, really, you know, interestingly is, is the politics. <laughs> how, you know, how, how do you work with uh, older execs? How do you, uh, who, who've been doing the same thing for the last 20 years? How do you get your ideas through? How do you run pilots? And, 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 and uh, deck building was a skill I learned there. <laughs> Built a lot of decks there. And like, you know, some, some listeners might hear that and go like, man, that sounds terrible. But like, those are literally the, some of the most valuable skills I learned as a leader at, at this company, which, which was terrible, but, but, you know, very valuable. So, yeah, we've talked about that before. And I know folks will complain about the office politics and all of that, but it's actually a very valuable skill once you start going to larger companies where it's, it's almost a feature, not a bug where you kind of need that in order to maintain like the process and everything within a company. So yeah, it, it's great that you got to get that experience. I wanted to ask about, um, you were saying you optimize for title and experience, not the sexiness of the company. Where did you learn that? Was that just a hypothesis you had yourself or was there some teacher mentor who was like, hey, Joe, like forget the sexy companies, optimize for this instead? You know, <clears throat> I think part of it, when you know, going back to the boot camp, I was a little bit more mid-career than a lot of folks, right? I was 29 when I did the boot camp, So it was a true career pivot for me. So I, I think it was, and, and uh, you know, I am a millennial, but I'm, I'm probably borderline, you know, young millennial, right? So I think part of it was life experience. The other part was, I, I think I fundamentally like rejected this notion that I'm special and, you know, that the world needs to like keel over to me or, or whatever. So um, I can't say it was a specific person that, that kind of taught me that, uh, but it was just more like, the older I got, I just became a little bit more of a realist than my peer set uh, at the time. Yeah, maybe maybe the Masters of Divinity taught you some wisdom. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, maybe maybe I'll fast forward a little bit. We had met at People AI, where you were also VP of Marketing before yep. your current role at Entra. So, what are you focused on now? What are your the goals or challenges that you're focused on? Yeah, I mean. A good question. I mean, I, so I, I'm I'm a VP of growth marketing. So you know, one one thing I I specifically picked that title over kind of probably a more traditional title and traditional meaning maybe what what it was called ten years ago, which was like the man gen, specifically because I think old school like a uh, old school the man gen had has a had a very very defined definition. Typically, you know, the goal of a de demand gen leader was to drive MQLs, marketing qualified leads for the sales team to follow up on. And so much I think has changed in the last 10, 15 years, you know, the introduction of uh, account-based marketing, the introduction of product-led growth as a concept, the, the, you know, the, the disruption of this whole era of growth hacking and experimentation and all that, um, I think seeing the demand gen leader as also owning things like field marketing and events. I, you know, I think the role has shifted so much 
you know, um, at People AI, I really pushed for the title of growth marketing because it, it, it started to feel like it was becoming the, at least in the tech world, the, the, the de facto title for the person who really is just, you know, the person on the marketing team who's really committed to growth in whatever fashion that might be, whether it's users, leads, pipeline, revenue. Um, so I set up, I set that up to say, you know, at, 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 at uh, Entra now, that's really what I'm focused on. Like I, I'm the person on the leader on the marketing team that anytime, you know, someone has a question, how do we grow from this to this? You know, it, it kind of falls under my, my department. So I have a fairly wide remit. Um, I, I definitely have digital, which, you know, I would consider more traditional demand gen. I have a campaigns team, which is kind of more demand gen ABM, but I also have field and events uh, on, uh, uh, under me. I have content under me. Uh, I'm helping out build out our, our EMEA APAC uh, presence uh, with, you know, and, and so it, it's a fairly wide remit. Um, you know, if we, if we ever went into a, a more tradition or a more PLG motion, that would, that would kind of be under me as well. So, so those are kind of the things I'm focused on here. Yeah. And what would you say are the biggest challenges in your job? Like that's, those are a lot of different things to be doing. So yep. what, what are difficult parts of it? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's fewfold. Um, on the biggest challenge that comes to mind right now is hiring. Um, uh, our, our team is three Xing, uh, this year and, and the economy is not slowing us down, which is really exciting. I have a lot of director roles to hire, um, because, uh, uh and, and so that's, that's been probably the biggest challenge, uh, and, and what I'm focusing the most on. Um, I think, uh, uh, the second is education. I think, um, probably of, yeah, I, I think depending on the org, you know, the most, you know, uh, the most misunderstood uh, parts of marketing can either be kind of the growth demand gen side of the equation or, or product marketing. Um, so I think a lot of what I feel like I need to do is, hey, you know, when we talk about growth marketing, what are we actually talking about? Why does it matter? You know, why should we even care about these metrics? So a lot of it has just been doing internal education and, and uh, you know, like, you know, educating the, the team, like why what I do is important. And then I think the third part, uh, which which might actually be the number one concern is, am I um, setting believable metrics? And I think the believable piece is key. Or like, uh, and what I mean by that is, are we all aligned that these are the metrics that matter? And do we really believe that? And two, um, am I meeting them? Right, because that's ultimately what's gonna, you know, uh, allow the company to continue to fund my programs and make sure I have a job. So, you know, I, I think lately those are really what I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah. the The way you're positioning your role as the VP of Growth Market is interesting. I think it's interesting to me because I've been enmeshed in this growth marketing thing, where you know that's that's kind of where I started. I didn't get much of a taste of the traditional demand gen that you talk about. So. When you talk about this internal education of the org, how are you defining or explaining growth marketing to the team? And what are the metrics you're proposing that folks are getting used to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I think the definition is pretty similar to what, what I just talked about is, is I'm the leader on the org who's uh, in the marketing team who's thinking about growth, whatever and whatever, whatever that means to you. I think for most B2B companies, that's revenue. Which is uh, you know which is uh, uh, which a KPI of or a leading indicator of revenue is pipeline or leads right so so I, I think that's one strain of it right where you know like and that's an education in and of itself like I think everyone on the executive level understands hey revenue is a good thing and we want to see this grow uh, you know time and time again I think but we have to educate you know if by the time I realize revenue is down, it's already too late, right? Like that's that's a key thing. And, and, and the way we get ahead of that is we introduce the concept of leading indicators, which is actually something you and I spent a, you know, a lot of time focused on at People AI. Like what are all the leading indicator metrics before revenue that we could start looking at to kind of warn us, like the canary in the coal mine that says, oh, if X is down, we, we should fix this. Otherwise, in three months, it's going to hurt revenue. And because marketing typically is more of an early cycle, I mean, marketing in some ways is the canary in the coal mine, right? We're paying attention 
attention to some of those leading indicators like leads, marketing qualified leads, MQLs, pipeline, the conversion rates in between those stages. And so, so there's a lot of education there. So when, when, um, so when I, when I report to the executive team, Hey, marketing generated 200 leads, the response isn't, Oh, well, I can't, I can't, you know, bring leads to the bank, which, which is a response I've actually heard in the market. It's like, Oh, uh, wow. That's lower than before. There might be some risk here. Let's really dig in to see what's happening, right? And 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 I think that's kind of the education process. You know, probably a better better indicator. You know, just to drive alignment is pipeline because most people understand. You know, like uh, you know, pipeline solves all pain, right? You know, so it's like, hey, yeah. our pipeline is down. That's probably going to impact revenue three six months down to. You know, we should dig in and figure out what's going on here. Yeah, I think you're talking about something really interesting here. Our our audience tends to be, you know. Some folks in marketing leadership, some folks are who are, who are individual contributors who want to eventually be in those roles. But the thing that you kind of have to learn the hard way sometimes is as you move up to a leadership role, your job is no longer to do the work. Your job is educating and alignment. Yep. And that often means talking to other functional leaders who don't know what you do in your job or what your team does. So it's now your job to explain the importance and how how your team functions and how you will work together with that leader. That was something I personally had to learn the hard way. Yep. I couldn't just explain growth or what I was doing. It had to be, oh, here's what growth is first. And let's start there and then figure out how we work together before I tell you about campaigns and experiments, because yep. none of that matters if if they're not aligned at a higher level. Yeah, I, I, I joke all the time, like, and I, actually, I already said this on this podcast, the number one thing I do as a leader here is build decks. And, 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 and on one hand, it's a joke. On the other hand, it's actually not that far off from the truth. And then one of the things I think people who work for me, uh, they are a little bit startled by is how, how maniacal I am about decks, like, you know, like formatting, like I, I get our creative director to come in and teach my team, like, how do you format, you know, and, and, you know, like titles and all of those things, because, you know, Dex, for whatever reason, is is the way most companies drive alignment at this point, right? And 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 it's not. I'm not maniacal about it just because I want to produce a pretty artifact, but I'm maniacal about it because if you have the right deck, it becomes the key piece. Like what I what what typically happens for me after three to six months in a role is I have this master deck. It's typically about twenty to thirty slides. And in almost every one-on-one I have with a cross-functional stakeholder, if they have a question, I'm like, oh, well, you know, I have a slide for that. Can I can you give me a second? Let me pull that up in my deck. Like, that's not even a strategic thing I've I've you know decided to do. It just sort of happened that way because I, I realized I needed to build a lot of decks. And it, it kind of became the key piece for me to drive alignment, you know, uh, uh, cross-functionally within an organization. Mm-hmm.